We often feel a sense of being scatterbrained, as if our minds are racing in all sorts of directions and we don't know how to focus. It's difficult to keep our minds on one task at a time. Why is this so problematic when our minds are jumping from one place to another? Because when you go from one thought to the next constantly, you don't end up thinking any thoughts fully. You don't think about something properly and entirely. You just jump from one thing to the next and then you jump so many times that eventually you jump right back to the beginning where you started and you feel like you've wasted your time. It's even worse when you act on these random thoughts because then you engage yourself in one acti activity to the other, often useless activities, never really completing an activity. And this is also a problem, why? Because again, you jump from one to the next until you get right back to the beginning and you feel that you haven't accomplished anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a person who has this kind of habit. And Allah says what? أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَاهُ Have you seen the one who has taken his desires as his God, as his deity, as something that deserves 100% obedience? He just jumps after his desires. Whatever impulse he has, he's very impulsive. He just jumps right to it. We all know that behaving in this way leads us to a point where the end of the day comes or maybe even the end of our lives come and we feel like we haven't accomplished much and we're full of regret. So the question is, how can I calm the storm? How can I calm the storm in my own mind? How can I remain focused? Number one, realize that a lot of the mind's overactivity is an attempt to escape the present moment. Oftentimes, your mind is jumping all over the place because what? You are trying to avoid the pain of some particular thought that is nagging you right now. And so, instead of just instinctively jumping from one thought to the next, ask yourself, what am I trying to avoid right now? Why are my thoughts all over the place? What am I avoiding? What is it that I'm dodging? Maybe I need to indulge and sort of uh, focus in on it so I can finally uh, cure it or quell this, 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 this nagging, uh, jumping attitude. So number two is analyze it. Make sure that you analyze. Pay attention to your thought patterns. Try to pay attention and figure out which thoughts are continuously reoccurring? Is it something that's funny to me? Is it something that's a concern of mine? Is there some sort of unfinished business that I need to attend to? Is there something I need to get off of my chest? And by analyzing your own thought process, you actually end up robbing this, uh, th these ideas from taking hold over you. You rob them of their power. Instead of them controlling you, you now develop the control over them. So this is an important practice to develop. See where your mind jumps to. See what keeps on reoccurring. Analyze, why is it that I keep obsessing over certain thoughts over others? And then inshallah ta'ala, you gain control over them so that they do not control you. A third bit of advice is what? Try writing things down. Practice the beautiful art of writing. By organizing your thoughts, by expressing them carefully with very specific chosen words, by writing down a schedule or a to-do list, you feel like you've, been un you've unloaded a heavy burden off of your back. It feels great. Sometimes you have all these thoughts that are jumping from one place to another, and you realize that, okay, wait, why don't I just sit down and write down everything that's nagging me, everything that I need to do, everything that's on my mind. When you actually write it all down, by the end of your list, especially if you've written every last detail, you feel like you can take a nice breath. Like there's this breeze that just has just passed through your mind, and you can whew, relax. That finally, I've gotten it off my chest. At least I know it's been written down. Number four, don't follow every random thought that jumps into your mind. Following it would mean that, uh, you, would mean that you're letting it take you from one idea to the next, which, has, which you've done this countless times in the past before, it's consuming your mental energy, and it's leaving you feel drained with nothing accomplished. Imagine it this way, if you were on a highway and you see a beautiful tree, do you stop at every time you see a nice tree? No, of course not. You need to get to your destination. So in that exact same way, you don't stop at every little nice thing that you see. In that same way, you may be on the road of life. Every time you have a thought, instead of trying to fight with it or even instead of trying to indulge in it, these are two extremes. You know what you should do? Just let it pass by. You don't have to get mad that, oh, why did I notice that tree? No, I shouldn't notice it. You don't have to get upset about it. When you're on the highway, you notice a tree, but then you let it pass. You also don't stop. It's neither of the two extremes. So don't let it bother you. Don't try to fight the fact that thoughts come in and out because we can't fight that. We're not robots. We do have random thoughts that occur in our mind. But don't follow it as in don't like stop on the highway and waste your time. Just let them come and go and have that sort of 
passive, comfortable feeling of, yes, I'm having this thought now, but I'm not going to let it control me. I'm not going to follow down that rabbit hole. I'm simply going to move forward with what is important. Number five, recognize that sometimes the problem is that a person is tortured by the past. Sometimes the reason why a thought keeps reoccurring, sometimes the reason why you keep on being plagued by certain ideas is because maybe a certain event was traumatizing and it won't go away. The first thing that you should do is recognize that this traumatizing thought is just a thought. It's not happening now, right? Sometimes we let it consume us that it actually consumes our present moment. No, it happened in the past, it's over, it should not completely consume me. Number two is that a thought is not you, nor does it define you, right? A thought can come to your mind or a certain event may have happened, but that's not who you are. Yes, maybe you regret something, but you can move past it. It is done. You can leave it in the past where it belongs. The best way to get over it, perhaps, is to learn the lesson from it. If you have some sort of a painful memory that keeps reoccurring, maybe instead of just feeling hurt by it or trying to avoid it and then it just keeps coming back, ask yourself, what lesson can I learn from this painful event? This idea that keeps coming back, what am I trying to learn from this? What conclusions can I make? How can this make me a better person? How can this make me a better person moving forward so I can be more careful to not do that again or to not deal with these type of people again or whatever the case may be? This can be discovered through reflection if it's a small, burdensome thought, or it can be done through therapy if you're dealing with a great traumatic memory. So it's obviously case dependent. And oftentimes the past haunts our memories when we're subconsciously feeling guilty. So the solution is to do what? To make toba. The solution oftentimes, of course it's case dependent, but oftentimes if a thought keeps reoccurring and is plaguing you, maybe it's because deep down inside you know what you did was wrong and you need to repent and maybe even ask somebody for forgiveness for what you've done so that you can heal and move past it. Whatever the case may be, you don't overcome it by avoiding it. So analyzing it, talk to somebody about it, going to therapy, making toba, whatever, these are all different options and it's all case dependent, but ignoring it is just gonna make it keep coming back over and over and over again. Number six, recognize that negative thinking has a addictive quality to it. We might not think it, we might not realize it, but sometimes you become addicted to being negative. A part of you wants to hold on to that pain. Perhaps it plays a role in your identity. You say, you're, you say to yourself, who am I? I'm the person who has been through the worst, right? It's part of who you are. And so therefore you hold on to these nagging thoughts. You hold on to your pain because it's part of your identity. Perhaps it gives you and your life meaning, significance above others. Let me tell you how I've suffered. You wanna keep reiterating and going over and over again about the past, about how you've been in pain and you keep reiterating in your mind. Why? Because you feel like you're more significant than everybody else because of it. Perhaps it feeds your ego because the anger that runs through you when you remember these negative thoughts lets you rant, it lets you scream, and screaming makes you feel big and powerful, and without that pain, you must be calm, and you shrink, and you feel small. Perhaps we think that if we can complain enough, then we'll get our way, because we still have the childish mentality that we're carrying with us, the childish attitude of what? Cry until somebody fixes it. Not realizing, not realizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Indeed, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. So these are all potential reasons why holding on to negative feelings can be addictive. We need to analyze ourselves and figure out why am I holding on to this negative past? Why do I keep reiterating these ideas? Maybe one of these reasons are, 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 is the cause. Number seven, know that you are fully capable of gaining control over your own mind. This is the biggest thing. Sometimes people will say, what? Well, I just can't control it. I mean, you know, random thoughts, I, I, I'm so scatterbrained, I can't focus. Know that you do have the ability. It's not just a maybe, it's an absolute certainty. I'll give you an example. I'm talking right now, and I want you to focus on now until now. What were you thinking about for those few seconds? The answer is nothing. You know why? Because you were in a state of receptiveness you were in a state of paying attention. When I said from now till now, you were just waiting, receptive, not thinking a single thought. Inshallah ta'ala, I'm, I'm willing to bet that the vast majority of you, if not all of you, weren't thinking a single thing. What does that prove? It proves 
that you have the ability to empty your mind and be in a state of complete receptiveness and attentiveness. You have that ability, even if it's only for one or two seconds. So the objective is really to realize that you're capable of it and then to what? Expand it. Realize that you can focus your mind and empty your mind of all sorts of thoughts. But now here's the question. How can I lengthen that? Instead of for just a few seconds, maybe a minute. And there's different techniques. There's different practices that you can do. For example, we know that focusing on absolute nothingness can feel impossible. If you just try to sit and say, I'm going to think about nothing, it's subhanAllah, it's very difficult. However, there are certain practices, simple practices, like for example, you're sitting maybe in your house, maybe lying down in your bed, and you just ask yourself to listen to your own breathing. Or for example, pay close attention to exactly what your hands are feeling. Pay close attention to what your legs are feeling, and so on and so forth. You, it's not that you think of nothing, it's that you think of something very small, but focus all your attention on it. And by doing so, you're effectively emptying your mind and gaining control over your thoughts. And when you can do this for one minute, two minutes, five minutes, and you gain control over this, alhamdulillah, you develop the ability to actually focus. So these exercises are possible and they are beneficial. Number eight, a common question is, if I'm so present in the moment, how could I ever focus and plan on the future? I mean, you're saying, you know, just, just be completely in the moment and be present in the moment and don't be distracted by all these, you know, surrounding thoughts. Well, okay, but how will I plan out my future then? So to be clear, the objective isn't to ignore the future. The objective is instead, it's not like you're trying to ignore the future and live in blissful ignorance moment by moment. No, that's not the objective. The objective is to identify what the plan is for the future. Map out how you're gonna to work towards that future and then be fully present in the moment as you're working towards it. In simple terms, it is learn to enjoy the process. So, for instance, it's not that you ignore the future but that you plan it out, you write things down, you have a schedule. And then now that you know what your schedule is, be present in the moment from step to step. I know this sounds very abstract, let me give some practical examples. I want you to imagine a person who has the beautiful intention and goal of memorizing the Qur'an. Now, you want to become a hafiz. MashaAllah, that's a beautiful intention. So you get enticed by the proposition of one day I'm going to be a hafiz, and it seems so beautiful, and it is. But the issue is you start memorizing the Qur'an. And then after one day, after one week, after one month, you're always thinking the same thought, when am I going to be done? When am I going to be done? Why isn't it, how much closer am I, am I to the end? And obviously that nagging thought can be, can, can be very demoralizing. It can bring you down. Why? Because there's so much to go. I've only memorized, let's say, a page. I've only memorized two pages. SubhanAllah, there's so much to go. And so you become demoralized and eventually you quit. However, there's a different way of thinking about it. Yes, you have the, 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 the plan of memorizing the Qur'an. But you don't keep the future goal in mind. Instead, you ask yourself the question, why do I want to become a hafiz? What is the goal? What, what, is the, what is the greater idea behind it? And then you realize it's because I love the Qur'an. And then because you love the Qur'an, I love, you realize that you love the Qur'an regardless of how much you know or you don't know. And therefore, every single time you open up the Mus'haf, you just indulge in the page that you're in. You just enjoy what you're memorizing at that moment. You try to understand it. If you don't understand the language, then you read the translation. You read the tafsir. You just try to analyze it. Come up with reflections. Enjoy the moment that you're in. Be present in the moment. Enjoy the process. Get out of your own way of the thoughts of when will I be done and how long is it going to take and uh, instead of just get out of your own way and learn to enjoy the process and then when I'm done memorizing this one page I'll move on to the second one and I'll enjoy that second one intensely as long as it takes me to memorize it and when you do that one by one and this applies to anything this applies to schoolwork this applies to going to work in whatever jobs whatever field you're in it applies to everything learn to enjoy the process and be fully present in the moment this is the difference between constructively planning and working towards a goal versus allowing destructive, nagging thoughts to demoralize you. Destructive, nagging thoughts are often rooted in ego. And so this is a very important point. That number nine, don't confuse your desire for improvement for the sake of Allah. Sometimes we have this desire for self-improvement for Allah's sake, but sometimes we confuse it with our own egos. And this is very dangerous. You need to just differentiate them. Why? Because ego, always wants instant results. It always wants instant satisfaction. And when it doesn't get what it wants, what happens? It makes you throw a tantrum. 
so that you can resist the feeling of weakness to prove how strong you are and how loud you can get and how you can throw something or throw a punch or something like this. We know that the Prophet says the strong man is not the one who can beat other people up, wrestle people down, overpower people. Rather, the strong one is who? That the strong one is, is, is the person who can control themselves in a fit of rage. And so yes, we need to, instead of telling ourselves, oh, I'm getting angry for the sake of self-improvement, realize that perhaps this is just ego. Don't beat yourself up when you don't reach your goal. Because you're a human being. You're not always going to hit exactly what you want to do in that exact day. Sometimes people get mad and they say, I told myself I was going to do this and I didn't do it and they throw a tantrum. The fact of the matter is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, in fact, commands us, and don't forget this, this ayah. Allah says what? وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ خَدَى إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Allah says, never say, don't say this. Don't say that I'm going to do this tomorrow. Say, except if you say, inshallah. What does that mean? It doesn't just mean the word inshallah, it's the idea, it's the intention of saying, look, I do intend this tomorrow, but maybe Allah intends something else. I have to be easy going. I have to recognize that Allah might have another plan. And so that is submission to Allah, and that is the way you move forward in a positive way. So when we look at these 10 different points, we recognize that what? You re realize that sometimes your inability to focus is, number one, an attempt to escape the present moment. Number two, so that you, the way you, you, you fix that is by analyzing it and rob it of its power. Number three, you write it down. You write down what's on your mind so that you can calm your mind and you can relax. Number four, you don't fight random thoughts, but you just let them pass. Number five, you realize that there's an addiction to negative thinking. Number six, you learn the lesson from the painful memories of the past. And number seven, you even repent from them if necessary. Number eight, you practice uh, 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 repetitiveness, you, you, the, the repetitive exercises, you keep on repeating these exercises of focus. You learn to practice these focus exercises of calming your mind down, focusing on your breathing and so forth to try to clear your mind. Number eight, you learn to enjoy the process of what you're doing instead of only letting na nagging thoughts about the goal bother you. Number uh, nine and um, uh, uh, number ten, excuse me, don't confuse the desire for self-improvement with ego. And inshallah, I will continue in the second khutbah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Bismillah. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. So now that you realize that there are ways to gain control over your scattered mind and you have the ability to develop a sense of focus, you now have a shot at three different sunan, three different sunnas of the Prophet And these three sunan are a sunnah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a sunnah within yourself, and a sunnah with the people. What are these three different sunan that we need to develop in our lives? The first one, the sunnah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sunnah of having khushu'ah. If you develop the ability to gain focus and not have such a scattered brain where you're always distracted, then you are developing this great and noble achievement of having khushu'ah. Why? Because this is the key to success. As Allah ta'ala tells us, qad aflaha al-mu'minun, that indeed successful are the believers. Their number one quality is what? Alladheena hum fi salatihim khashi'un. That in their salah, when they pray, first of all they pray. That's first and foremost. If you're not praying, then forget, you don't even qualify. SubhanAllah. So, this is not my opinion. If you don't like what I'm saying, this is Allah Ta'ala's speech. That number one, not only do they pray, which is a given, that in their prayer, in their khams salawat, in their five daily prayers, they have khushu'ah. They know how to focus. They know how to block out nagging thoughts. Perhaps they train themselves. Perhaps they analyze themselves. Perhaps they wrote down their nagging thoughts. Perhaps they talk to different people about it. All these different techniques they use to do what? To develop a sense of control over their thoughts so that when they pray, they have khushu' in their salah. And subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ tells us something so powerful about khushu' He says, أَوَّلُ شَيْءٍ يُرْفَعُ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ الْخُشُوعِ حَتَّى لَا تَرَى فِيهَا خَاشِعًا The first thing that will be lifted from this, from this ummah is what? Khushu'ah. The first thing that will, is, is, is to go. The, the, the most difficult thing to hold on to is what? Khushu'ah. It's the first thing to leave. To the point 
that you will not find in this ummah a single person who has khushu'ah. Subhanallah, hatta la tara, until you don't even see fiha in it, in this ummah, khashi'an, a single person with khushu'ah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us people of khushu'ah, ameen ya rabbil alameen. What a scary thought. That subhanAllah, not a single person, the whole masjid is full. People are praying salah and everybody's mind is on, I got to go to work and what do my family say and oh, that person's bothering me and this, that and the other, I got to go pick this up, I got to go pick that up. Everybody's khushur is completely gone. And subhanAllah, perhaps one of the greatest reasons is because we're not understanding the Quran. And subhanAllah, this is a side issue. But subhanAllah, we need every small surah that you know. You need to know what you're saying. You need to know the words. I'm not saying you need to learn all of Arabic perfectly. Subhanallah, that would take a lifetime. But at least know what every single verse in Fatiha means. Know what every single ayah in Surah Al-Nas, Surah Faraq, Surah Ikhlas, etc. All these short surahs, you have to know what you're saying. That is the absolute necessary foundation and key in order to develop this khushur and to have presence of mind. Number two. So we said you can develop three sunan. The first one was what? with Allah, and that is khushu'a, uh, uh, concentration and devotion and sincerity in your prayer. Number two is within yourself. SubhanAllah, did you know that 14 times in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believers as la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. That the believers are those who, they la khawfun alayhim, there is no fear upon them, wa lahum yahzanun, and they are not grieving. Fear is for the future. You fear about the future. Grief is for the past. So what does that mean? If their minds, are not constantly worried and fearing what's gonna to happen tomorrow. What about this? What if this happens? What if that happens? I don't know, what if there's an economic crisis? What if there's a war? What if, and every moment, the believer is not that type of person. They're not constantly consumed with fear. And so if their mind is not focused on the, uh, in fear in the future, and they're not constantly worried and grie excuse me, grieving about the past. They're not in a constant state of, what did I do? I can't believe I did that. Why did this happen? How could this happen to me? They're not, th these, uh, 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 ideas are not constantly plaguing them. So then the question is, if your mind is not in the future and your mind is not in the past, where is, where is their mind at? Present in the moment. That is the quality of the believer. The, the believer has presence of mind. All of us, I hope, are in this Jum'ah right now. Why? Because we're actually listen, listening to the Khatib. Instead of having your mind about what I did last week or what I will do next week or whatever the case is, where, wherever you are, that's where you are. You have a presence of mind. Again, it doesn't mean that you can't think about the future. It's that it doesn't consume you with worry, worrisome and useless thoughts. That you have a certain presence of mind. You focus on what you're doing so that you do it with ihsan. This is the quality of the believer. 14 times Allah Ta'ala describes the believer with this, these qualities. We need to pay attention to that. That repetition means it's something we need to focus on. We need to truly develop the sense of what? Being present in the moment. What does that mean? That means that you let go of the illusion that things could have been different. Allah Ta'ala has written things and decreed the way you are, where you are, who you are right here and now. That's the way it is. I accept it. I have made peace with that. And furthermore, I have faith in what will be. I have submitted myself to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. I have tawakkul ala Allah. So when you accept the qadr of Allah of the past, and when you accept the tawakkul ala Allah of the future, then that is called what? Full submission. That's Islam. That's what Islam is. That's the way you develop this, this idea of being present in the moment, of having presence of mind by submitting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not regretting the past, not worrying about the future, rather being present in the moment. So yes, number one, you want to develop the sunnah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of having khushu'ah. Number two, you want to develop the sunnah within yourself of being present in the moment so that you're not worried about the future or grieving about the past as Allah describes the believers many a time. And the third sunnah that we should develop, subhanAllah, is having the sunnah of being fully present with the people that we're with. You should be fully present with the person that you're with. When you spend time with somebody, actually be there with them. We know that the Prophet ﷺ was described as إِذَا إِلْتَفَتَ إِلْتَفَتَ جَمِيعًا When he would turn himself towards somebody and talk to somebody, he would turn himself completely. What does that mean? That they observed the Sahaba were so intent and so keen on paying attention to the mannerisms of the Prophet ﷺ and they said, SubhanAllah, look at how amazing it is. When somebody's talking to him, the rest of the world just disappears. He is completely in the conversation. You can't develop that quality unless you can be present in the moment. You have to develop that quality first within yourself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your prayer. And then with people, what can you do? You can truly listen to them. Instead of being what is so common today, the type of person who what? Yeah, I'm listening, I'm listening, and I'm constantly checking, uh-huh. Yeah, 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 that's very interesting, fascinating, sure. How often does this happen? 
How many people are constantly, you're trying to talk to them and their, their, their mind is somewhere else? This is an ugly quality to have, let's be honest. Nobody likes this. To the point that you could see a, a full group of friends or a full family at dinner. They went out to a restaurant, none of them are looking at each other, none of them are talking to each other, all of them got the phone out. Subhanallah, you're, you're with me but you're not with me. So we want to develop, be present in the moment. If I'm with you, I'm truly with you. And subhanAllah, when you develop that quality, you become beloved to people. People end up loving you. People end up loving being around you. Why? Because you're really committed to being with them. You want to talk to them. You're really listening to them. There are some people that when you have a conversation with them, they don't just look at you. You feel like they're looking through you, subhanAllah. I've, I've experienced this with certain people. Very few. But there are certain people that they're truly present in the moment. And subhanAllah, I think perhaps, this is a quality of those who the Prophet ﷺ mentioned when he said, أَلَا أُخْبِرُكُمْ بِمَنْ يَحْرُمْ عَلَى النَّارِ أو بِمَنْ تُحْرَمْ عَلَيْهِ النَّارِ That the Prophet ﷺ said, should I not inform you of those people who the fire is completely unlawful for? They cannot, they, they, they are prohibited from going to the fire. And who are they? He says, عَلَى كُلِّ قَرِيبٍ هَيِّنٍ لَيِّنٍ سَهْلٍ It is upon each person who is near to the people, amicable, easygoing. You know, just an easygoing, kind person. Hayin, layin. And how do you develop that quality? Well, because you're not overly worried about the future. You're not overly regretting the past. Your mind isn't in 10 different places. You're not half listening to them while checking your phone. You are easygoing, amicable. Why? Because you have accepted the qadr of Allah. Because you have tawakkul ala Allah. Because you're not jealous of other people. Because you're not envious of other people. When you sit with people, you truly pay attention to what they're saying and you have that presence of mind to really be with them. And subhanAllah, when you develop that quality and people appreciate it in you, what is the Prophet I'm saying? When you have this quality, subhanAllah, the, the, the fire is haram for you. Allahu Akbar. Such a beautiful quality. The fire, it, it's impermissible. Why? Because you have these beautiful qualities. So may Allah Ta'ala make us of those who develop presence of mind. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who do not have scatterbrains and who are constantly distracted. Rather, we are people who can live and be in the moment. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who have ihsan in what we do. Because when we do something, we fully commit to what we're doing. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma hdina fi man hadayt. Wa afina fi man afayt. Wa tawallana fi man tawallayt. Wa barik lana fi ma a'atayt. Wa qina sharra ma qadayt. Fa innaka taqdi wa la yuqda alayk. Innahu la yadillu man walayt. Wa la ya'izzu man adayt. Tabarakta rabbana wa ta'alayt. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وأقم الصلاة